Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks. Thank you to the organizers for a, for a wonderful day. And particularly thanks to Melody for the kind and flattering uh, invitation to be here. Uh, I'm glad I'm the last, because this is going to be probably the lightest and most informal presentation uh, of the day. I didn't know how to tune it, so I prepared some, you'll see, very rough basic slides. And I won't take much of your time talking initially, so because I would like you to, to interact with me, so I'll, I'll try to adjust what I say to your expectations or your questions. So please interrupt whenever you want, otherwise it will be too short. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> no, there you go. No, I know, I know, I know. I, know. I, do, I do agree. Uh, but uh, so just to let you know that uh, I'm a senior postdoc at the U of T, particularly at the, the Ben Blanco's lab. And I work in this, uh, at the Donnelly Center. It cannot be seen from here because there are some hospitals there uh, <laughs> hiding it, but basically walking distance from here at uh, the St. George campus. And so this is how the, the Donnelly Center looks like. This is not a radical sport that we practice there. It's just, <laughs> I just took this photo because this gentleman here is about to clean the window of my office. So it was, uh, it was a, a, a nice picture. Anyway, the reason why I'm here is because I'm a, a recipient of uh, uh, an international outgoing fellowship from Marie Curie uh, Actions. And uh, the way this is going to work, I'll just talk for a few minutes about my background. And uh, I apologize for sort of centering the first part of the talk on myself, but basically I'm the exotic here. I'm the European that comes to Canada. So I suppose you might, you might want to, to hear about it. Then I'll tell you just five minutes about what I do, what my research is, and then I'll end up with, with uh, my experience in Canada and what the, the, the fellowship is about, if you agree, okay? So this, I uh, was born and raised in this uh, town in northwest uh, of Portugal called Viana do Castelo. It's, uh, you can see it's, it's beautiful. Yes, there is a beach there, and uh, so I really recommend, and let me know if you want to go there. Oh, you've been there. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Uh, you mean the water is cold. The temperatures in summer are as warm as in most of Portugal, but it's absolutely true. If you like windsurfing, you love it. Uh, but, uh, but then at the age of 18, I said, okay, now I, uh, I'm going to university. And I went to, to the capital of my country, Lisbon, that also has, uh, as you see, beautiful monuments. And we have our own version of the Golden Gate uh, in Lisbon. Actually, I don't resist uh, to show you this one because uh, Lisbon is a bit like Vegas. You can see, you know, Rome, San Francisco, Rio de Janeiro, all, all of those in one, in one postcard. And, and this is a real photo, OK? Anyway, what, what I, I did go to Lisbon to study. I had a lot of fun, but I, I was there to, to have my, my, my degree. And in Portugal, uh, until a few years ago before, some of you will heard about the Bologna Agreement. Um, but when, when I, I did start in my, my first degree, the, the typical degree in Portugal was five years degree. So it was called licenciatura. It's basically a bachelor's followed by a master's in one, in one package. And, and I started by actually studying physics and engineering in, um, in, tech, in the Technical University of, of Lisbon. So this is sort of the, this still is the leading engineering school in Portugal and the largest actually uh, school. Um, and as I was about to finish my degree, I had some courses in biophysics and I realized, I, I mean, I, I wasn't, I was not so keen on, on, uh, on theoretical physics. I really did want to apply what, uh, what I was learning there. And I decided to uh, a graduate program in biophysics and biomedical engineering in the Faculty of Sciences of the University of Lisbon. And uh, I had a course in cell biology, and I got really excited. And then I said, OK, uh, I got uh, to meet um, Professor Camo Fonseca. I for forgot to put her name there that said, well, um, you know, uh, we, we want someone with, that is not afraid of computers and, but has a scientific mind. So because bioinformatics, and I will tell you a bit more about it in a few minutes, didn't exist as a field at the time. And so I say, OK, I really, you know, this is a, a way of applying uh, my engineering skills. I really like biology, so let's risk and start a PhD. And so, and this, this does not mean that I took one year uh, to finish my PhD. It just means that the first year of my PhD happened in Lisbon in the medical uh, school. But the other thing Professor Carmo Fonseca told me, uh, or asked me after I agreed to do a PhD with her, was 
will you have your suitcase ready? And I said, yes, of course. So there we go. Mm, the following year, I was sent to, for a few months to, to Heidelberg in Germany. You see another nice postcard there. Um, and I got some months of training at uh, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory called EMBL, which is one, it was an amazing, an amazing experience. And after, after that, late in early 2003, I was also sent to, to, to Cambridge in the United Kingdom, another nice uh, postcard, and uh, punting is the, the local sport. Um, and I was supposed to be there for six months, then six months became a year, then a year became the rest of my PhD. So I ended up staying in Cambridge for a long time. And uh, as a side note, I got funded by European money via the Portuguese Ministry of Science. So I was a self-funded PhD student, which is great because it made it much easier to actually move around. Also because the fellowship or the scholarship allowed me to, to, to do a mixed, what they call the mixed PhD, which is part in Portugal, part abroad. So that was great. That gave me a lot of, of freedom. And uh, we realized that I was being more productive in Cambridge. And uh, so I ended up staying until the end of my PhD, uh, specifically at the Department of Oncology of the University in this, uh, in this research center called the Hutchinson MRC. They call it, actually, this looks a bit, these chimneys look a bit like the Titanic. But they call this the iceberg, because there is another one here that looks even more like the Titanic. So uh, it's famous for being the, it's called the iceberg. Anyway, um, as I was finishing my PhD, I didn't know exactly what I want. I was planning actually to leave Cambridge, but then this amazing, and I, I mean seriously uh, spectacular, new research institute, the, the Cancer Research UK, Cambridge Research Institute was opening. And I ended up staying for a postdoc there. Um, so Cancer Research UK, I think, is the largest uh, research-related uh, charity in the United Kingdom. I mean, they have a, just a nearly budget of around 400 million pounds, which is so that's roughly six to seven hundred million dollars. Uh, so that's that's pretty a pretty a pretty good funding for cancer research. And so, as I said, I did a, a postdoc there. Uh, at the university, they call these a research associate. And so basically, this is what I had to tell you about my life before coming to, to Canada. So there was a bit of traveling, a bit of mobility here, but all inside Europe. And so I said in 2010, I said, OK, enough of Cambridge, enough of Europe. I want to try something different. And then I said, I'll I'm going to North America. I'll get back to this later. OK, the, any, any question? No. So a bit about my, my research. What do I do? I mentioned bioinformatics. I actually preferred uh, computational biology as a definition for, for what I do. Um, and so if you, if you go to Wikipedia or any other website, if you type computational biology, you would find oh, this is a very simple but accurate definition. I, what I do is basically to use mathematical or computational methods to address questions in biology be those questions theoretical or uh, of uh, an experimental nature, OK? So that's, uh, that's my, distinguish, my, my distinction between computational biology and bioinformatics is precisely that bioinformatics is more to develop those methods. I'm a user. I'm not a developer. I use those methods to address biological questions, OK? So my, my raw material, my data, are essentially DNA or RNA or protein sequences, and basically what I get are files with long strings of apparently meaningless text and some biological annotation attached to it. And also, I get numbers, tables with numbers that basically have to do with the abundance of those molecules. So what we call gene expression, how much of each gene is being expressed in the cell or in a tissue, that's, I get those, those numbers. And, um, and the techniques, the computational techniques, are conceptually very simple. So what I do is actually conceptually very, very basic. Um, if you know a bit of programming and a bit of math, there's nothing sophisticated about it. Essentially, I manipulate text files. I, I use these sequence alignment algorithms. So actually, I look if you have sequences from DNA, RNA, protein, and you align them all against each other to look for things that are different, things that are in common, and so on. I, I use some basic statistics to deal with this number. And then I look for patterns. So there are well-known what we call 
clustering methods that try that basically what they do is to cluster together things that are more similar to each other. And then classification methods, which is once those patterns are found, if new data come, then I can actually guess what that data are about, what those data are about. So if you if you if you're not biologists, and I assume most of the audience are, you know, not biologists, just getting you back to 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 basics and try to explain a bit better what I do. Um, most of you probably learn in, in school the, the central dogma of molecular biology that says that your genetic information uh, can be found in the DNA, those in the chromosomes. Each, each of your cells will have the entire genome inside the nucleus, the, the, the full DNA. And then there is another molecule called the messenger RNA that basically uses the DNA as a template and that, takes that message out of the nucleus of the cell to the cytoplasm and a molecular machine called ribosome will translate the messenger of the messenger RNA into protein. And proteins are both the structural and functional units of, of the organism, okay? This is, this looks already complicated, but it's actually very, it's very simple. So, so actually, <laughs> the, the whole thing is much more complicated than that. And this is a simplification as well, I must tell you. Okay, so, so there's a lot of, in particular, there's a lot happening to that messenger RNA on the way. And that's precisely uh, where my research, is, uh, my research is focused on. In, in one of these many processes or many steps of mRNA processing, there is one called splicing, which is the one uh, myself and our group are interested in. And, and this, the discovery of mRNA splicing actually gave the, the, um, the Nobel Prize to Richard Johnson and Phil Sharp in 1993. Phil Sharp is somehow my scientific grandfather given that Ben, my supervisor, was working with Phil Sharp when he got the Nobel Prize. So like, it's sort of, uh, he doesn't know me anyway, uh, just in case. So it's just a bit pretentious what I just said, but actually I, I look at him uh, in that way. Um, but just to let you know that, w what is splicing? And, and it's, um, it's one of the most, I would say, overlooked biological processes in the cell, and that's why I have a job. Um, so if these are the, the if this is the DNA, uh, what and this the, the, this bit in green is the gene, so the bit of DNA that is going to encode for a protein. What, if you're not in the fields, you might not know is that actually, the messenger RNA before being exported to be translated, so that that some chunks, some bits of that RNA are going to be discarded. So there is a molecular machine called the spliceosome that would actually you know, uh, get rid of part of the message and then splice together the interesting bits of the message into a shorter molecule. And then that shorter molecule is the one that is going to be translated into protein. So the, what makes this process very relevant is that there is what we call alternative splicing, which is if these bits here are the ones that get discarded and these bits here are the ones that will belong to the message that is going to be translated. This allows for a combinatorial selection of the interesting bits. So we call the ones that are removed introns, and these boxes here that will be included in the message exons. And you can have a different, from the same gene, from the same bit of DNA, you can have different proteins, okay, what we call different isoforms, if you select, or if the cell selects, different exons, different combinations of exons, okay? So, so suddenly it's not a gene encodes for a protein, it's a gene encodes for potentially many, many different proteins, likely with very different functions. So the complexity of the whole thing uh, changes. And actually when, the, when the, the human genome was sequenced and they realized that we only have uh, 20 to 25,000 genes, which is comparable to organisms that we were used to call basic or simpler than us, uh, splicing came to the rescue. After all, we are complex, you know, we have... A, uh, the, the thing is, some of those organisms also have uh, alternative splicing, but never mind. Uh, so, in terms of why, why is this important? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a good, uh, a good picture, but the idea is that if this, again, is the DNA and the boxes are the exons, I give you an example of this gene called alpha tropomyosin. Um, and what you see, I'm not sure you can read it, but I will tell you. So here, for instance, you will see what, what are the typical messenger RNAs. 
in different types of muscles. So there is one that here is striated muscle, a different type of striated muscle, uh, smooth, smooth, uh, smooth muscle, and then for instance brain. So you see that in different tissues or in different conditions, different exons are selected, and so from the same gene you have different proteins. Importantly, here you, you can read hepatoma. Hepatoma means liver. So you can see there's something, this, this, sp this splicing process, this exclusion, this definition, which bits need where, where to cut and which bits should be removed and which ones should be spliced together, has to be very accurate because if something goes wrong, and you have here an example where this exon here that is included in normal tissues actually doesn't get spliced in in liver cancer. If something goes wrong, disease is likely to, to happen. Okay? So this is just to let you know that why, why it is important and you can already sort of see the applications and the importance in clinical research of getting uh, understanding splicing right. Okay? So what do we know about alternative splicing? How, how is, you might be asking, so how, how do you regulate this selection of, of exons? And the answer is, well, we, we don't know everything, but we already know that the regulation is basically an interplay between protein factors, these blobs here that you see here, and, and, and actually some of the RNA sequences, some of the message has signals for them to know where to bind. And then is, is just some, some of them compete for the binding and then the, the, the relative abundance will tell if a certain exon is included or excluded and so on. So it's a very complex regulation and you see that also the messages that you can find the RNA in the RNA for the proteins to bind are very degenerate so it's not very deterministic. Uh, it's, it's not hard, it's not easy to model this. But our group um, actually in collaboration with a machine learning group also from U of T um, made some progress and last year, May last year, they, they actually made the cover of Nature for the, most of you know the, the importance of, of, of this uh, scientific journal. Um, because they somehow, they didn't really crack the full splicing code, but they actually made a lot of progress in modeling how this is regulated. And this is one of the reasons I, I applied for this, this the, the quality of the work they, they were doing. Other question that we are interested in is how has this alternative splicing process evolved? And um, so what, it, what is interesting is that most, you know, most of these structure, intranexons, things are conserved across animals, but the actual alternative splicing events tend to be species specific. So, you know, the same exon is alternative in human but different in mouse, but is not alternative in mouse and so on. So that's, what, that's basically what I'm trying to address with my uh, project, the one that uh, the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship is funding. So I'm actually taking, uh, so now there are these new high throughput technologies that allow me to sequence the mRNA, the full mRNA of, of different tissues in different species. And then the only thing I have to do is to take the, these reads, these bits of sequence that the machine gives me and align them against the genome and somehow not only know where things are being spliced in or out, but also the relative abundance of the molecules and try to come up with, with a model that allows me to predict splicing. And once I predict splicing with my model, then people in the lab can validate. And if they do validate, then we have medical applications. So if you understand how splicing works and you can predict, you can also say, okay, if I have this mutation here, then I might disrupt this pattern of splicing and that might explain this disease, or this type of cancer, and so on. So I'll move to, this is basically the science that I'm doing. Now, finally, I move to why in Canada, why the Marie Curie, which is probably the bit that you're more interested in, but I just wanted to give you the background. So first of all, why did I come to North America? And let me, let you, let me uh, tell you that this decision is prior to applying to, to the Marie Curie Fellowship. Okay, so I decided, okay, I had enough of Cambridge. Um, in science, it's not good to stay uh, too long in the same place and work with the same people for too long. Seven years corresponds to two shifts, let's say, in, uh, in academic terms. So basically a PhD and a postdoc. Um, and also, on a more personal level, I mean, I never lived out of Europe, so let's try a different lifestyle, different culture, uh, 
Um, also, in the work aspect, I mean, North Americans are famous for being, you know, more pragmatic and objective and competitive as well in the way they work. They have uh, most of the top universities in the world. Not that Cambridge was that bad, but, but uh, <laughs> you have to change. Um, and, uh, and, 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 they are, and also, I mean, you have resources here for, for cutting edge research. So I, am, I shortlisted a few labs, asked people for, for opinion. Uh, then I came up with a list of five laboratories. I applied to all of them. One said, we don't have space for you, but apply to my wife's lab. So that's the answer I got. The other four told me, well, come for an interview and let's see what, what happened. So in December 2009, I toured um, four labs and I ended up going back with, fortunately, with four job offers from labs in, the, in these uh, universities, Berkeley, Harvard, the MIT, and U of T. Um, and now, now this get us uh, just a, a side note here. So first of all, um, I, I, I flew back to Europe basically already decided. I mean, I didn't tell what is now my supervisor that I had decided because that allowed me to negotiate better terms, but I was already decided to go to come to Toronto. And, and some of my friends didn't understand, for instance, if Harvard is in the, why, why don't you go for the famous, uh, the number one? Um, so, so this is an important issue uh, because uh, I don't think the, the reputation should count for, unless, unless they are, you know, once you rank them, they, they are even, then you might say, okay. But I, I find that uh, silly to choose just because the university is famous or, or has a certain, I mean, if you, don't, um, if you don't like the project or if you don't like the people or whatever, it's silly. The, un the other side note, I, wanna, I didn't put it on the slides, but I think this is important, and um, Melody Salk remind me. It's the issue of seniority, and that's, that's important, in, and that's, I'm not sure if you will agree with me, that's the difference between Europe and, and North America. So the, the question that I got from, in most of the places I visited was, why aren't you applying for a principal investigated position? You know? So you know, you're, you're already in your 30s, you've done a long, successful postdoc in Cambridge, so it's obvious, you know, the academic ladder, PhD, postdoc, PI. Um, and my answer was always, well, I'm not ready, and I would be miserable and incompetent. And so one of, one of the things I, I see sometimes in academia is that is the, the definition of what is success or what, what it is to achieve uh, sometimes is measured, in my opinion, <laughs> in the wrong way. I mean, it doesn't matter how fast you, you get to a certain, I mean, it just matters, you know, if you enjoy what you, what you do. And if you reach a certain stage when you're ready for it and you know you, 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 you have the potential to do a good job. And the same applies to the choice of, of, of the university. The, it is also interesting that, and you could see, I'm not sure if you remember from Melody's slides, that the Marie Curie's have actually fellowships for people with 10 plus years of experience, postdoctoral fellowships for, for people with 10 plus years of experience. My, I was really unlucky, I had nine years of experience, so I, I still made it into the junior section. But I also applied and I, 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 will, I, will, I am also a recipient of a CIHR fellowship here that will automatically seize the moment five years of my PhD are done. So in May next year, actually, I could extend it for a bit, no, but they say, no, 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 you're five years, it's five years after your PhD, no more funding. Uh, so you see here, the stimulus is, uh, you know, do a postdoc and get out of the postdoctoral, you know, business quick, as quick as you can, five years and that's it. In Europe, or at least, at least from the Marie Curie, they say, well, if you think you, you rather be, you know, do a postdoctoral work for longer, or if you, you decide that you're not suited for an independent, let's say, group leader position, it's okay. I mean, you can still be useful in, in science. So that's something to, to think about. Um, so I told you, I, out of those four, I, I must confess I like them all, but Toronto was my favorite. Why? Well, the first one, I don't know. I went back with the gut feeling, not just general, you know, uh, that's where I felt better when I came for the visit. But more objectively, um, the scientific quality of the lab's recent work, and I show you the nature cover, uh, was an important issue. I, I do get along really well with my uh, current advisor, uh, Ben Blanco. And um, also the, the environment in, in the lab was really friendly. Uh, they did put a lot more effort than the others in, in hiring me. So they did try to get me. The others basically made an offer, they were nice, and it was a great time. But 
it, you can clearly tell. I mean, you want to be where people really want you to be there. Uh, and there was um, some strong interest. So I must tell you that the, the, the contract in all of these situations, the, the job offer didn't depend on getting my own funding, but they, they were, there is this stimulus to get the funding. But interestingly, only Toronto said they would top up my salary if I got my own funding. No one else said the same. So that's also interesting. The attitude here was, was more proactive in that sense. Also, this, the project that suited my scientific interest the better, and I really love Toronto, and I got this feeling that I would love Toronto's lifestyle, cosmopolitan, sort of quiet, you know, uh, that's pretty good. And uh, I have a bias towards welfare states. I mean, uh, I, I would get wonderful health insurance in the, in the US, so it's not, it was not a selfish not a selfish thing. I mean, all those the other three universities have very decent health insurance, but I, I immediately get more identified with the country. You know, where if you know people at least have basic uh, health covered and so on. So it's a sort of a matter of principles. I'm I'm sort of proud to be here. And uh, finally, the geography was an important issue. So so I I, I would rather be in the east coast because it's closer to Europe and to my family, but also the west coast is not that far. And uh, something I found out after I was in Toronto is that being in Toronto allows me, it's the only place, Toronto and Montreal are the only two places in the world where I can fly directly to Portugal having 50 kilos of luggage allowance in economy <laughs> class. <laughs> yes, I couldn't get it in Boston or in New York or anywhere else. I can get 50 kilos of luggage allowance in economy. This is great. Uh, unfortunately, they don't let me bring my mother's food, but that's another issue. Um, and now the question is why, why applying for, for the Marie Curie? I must confess I hesitated when applying because the Marie Curie International Outgoing Fellowship, they want me to go back to Europe. Right? I'm committed the third year to go back to Europe. And I thought, well, well what if I love Canada? What if I don't want to go back? Okay, I have to go back at least for a year. So that was the main source of hesitation. But there are many important things. One is that it's you know, prestigious and competitive. And it's a general's fellowship. So even in my junior section or, uh, of the fact, it's, it's still about 210,000 euros, so over $250,000 over the three years. Uh, what is interesting here is that the money doesn't come to Canada. So they don't, uh, th this question was, was right before. So Canada doesn't, doesn't even smell the money. So I'm paid in a Portuguese account uh, in euros. So part of my salary goes to an account in Portugal. I have two employers. So they are my official employer there, but I also have a contract here. So I have two contracts, pay taxes in two countries. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but, but they save money here for not having to pay the full, you know, most of my salary doesn't come from, from Canadian money anyway. Um, one of the things I really liked, and I'm going to tell you about it this in, in the next few slides, is that the, the rules for applying are very objective. I mean, they are very clear. It's one of those situations where, no, this is going to be hard work, but I know exactly what I have to do to succeed. And I know when the evaluation comes, it's going to be as fair as possible. And these things are always a bit subjective. You know, you have peer reviews, but the mood of the reviewer or whoever goes and looks at your application will influence the outcome. But this is a situation where actually the, the reviewers don't have that much margin for subjectivity. It's really as objective as you can get. So I was sort of um, excited about this. And um, of course, if I was to get the fellowship, uh, I'll be very independent because I will help, help to pay for most of my salary. But I would also have my own budget, you know, the research allowance that Melody also mentioned, which is now I'm independent in terms of deciding which conferences I, I can go to or if I need to buy books or computer or software or whatever, I do, I do have my own budget. And um, it's a good way of getting back if I decide that I would like to end up in Europe. It's a great way to you know, get back to my country and have a year to adapt and, and so on. Um, this will give me, once you're in the system, it sort of makes it easier to get future funding. So thinking. And um, it also puts me in touch with an important network of scientists, mainly in Europe. But, uh, and finally, it's, it's hard work, but once you've been through a Marie Curie application, you're ready to apply for anything. I mean, it's, it's, it's really excellent practice. Uh, okay, so I went for it. I was um, 
So if I say fortunate enough to get it, and then th this is what I mean by hardware. So this is the, the index of my, um, of the part B, so the actual scientific part of my, my application. And you would see that uh, the interesting bit starts in page three and ends in page 26. So it's not that long, it's 23 pa 24 pages that, I, that are important here. So, but you see that are 20, 24 pages, and I think I have something like 25 bullets. So it's basically one page per bullet rough numbers. So I didn't decide that these bullets would be here. This is, is on the application. You have to write this section, then this section, then this section. Only the references here, I think, are sort of my idea. Everything else, the titles of all these sections here, are explicit on the application, and you have, and the goals for each of them. So not only you have to address all of them, but you don't have much space, so you have to really summarize things properly. And then include your own, uh, so there's a section of the researchers. So if you want, you might try to impress them, but better be short. Uh, so it's, it really forces you to select them, your most important achievements. And also includes, um, for instance, the impact, which means I have to explain why, 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 why Europe should invest in me and why this time here in Canada is going to be useful and how can I make an impact when I go back. Okay, um, when I chose this, one of the things I, I think was in a way um, convenient for me is that there was already a collaboration between uh, the lab here and the lab in Portugal, which is my, actually my host in Portugal. And also it's easier uh, given, I, I'm not going to mention the bankruptcy uh, scenario here, but in terms of scientifically, Portugal is still an emergent country. It's not like the UK or Germany or France that, you know, have a few Nobel Prizes and are well established. Um, I think it's also easier to show that I can um, make an impact in Portugal than if I said, well, I'm going back to Cambridge, for example. Uh, so, and then the evaluation process, one of the things I would call your attention, and this is, for instance, for my fellowship, the evaluation of section two of the training, you see that there are thresholds. So not only the over, overall score is important, but you cannot score below certain thresholds on each section. So you cannot overlook any section. You will have to put an effort on every single section. And then you see that um, the instructions, actually you see more, the, the evaluation is here, and the instructions for the evaluator are here, much longer, see? So the reviewers don't have much room that they have to, to, to score based on, on certain, uh, certain important issues that are predefined. And also you know how much is section weights and so on. So here's another example, the impact, the same. Big instructions and then uh, they just, the evaluation is based on, on just addressing this issue. So it's, it's very objective. And so how has my experience been so far? I've been in Canada for uh, 13 months now. The fellowship only started uh, last June, which means I'll be here until May 2013. Um, and I must tell you, most of it you'll see, I mean, this means plus and I'll have a minus at the end. Um, but so far, so good. I mean, I've been having a great time in Toronto. I, I, I'm still, after a year, I still get along with my, with my boss, so that's good. I still find uh, the atmosphere in the lab, you know, easy, friendly, and very professional. Um, I did get the opportunity to have very interesting collaborations here in Toronto and also some international ones, but, but Toronto has a highly collaborative atmosphere and very good people in many different fields, which is great. Uh, so it's actually one of the very few universities in the world that is top 10 in, I think, in, I don't know in how many areas, but it's, 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 it's impressive. Um, and I do have, I'm given all the resources I need to do well. So if I don't do, it's my fault, not, can't complain about the support I, I got. Um, also, it is true, and I found here that indeed North Americans, or at least here, I have a more objective and focused approach to science. So I don't get distracted, let's say, as easily as I do in, in Europe. And, and things, you know, are very goal-oriented, and that is very, very nice. The minus, uh, and that's something, I don't want to be controversial here, if most of you are North Americans, but, uh, and I think that, that has not only to do with this particular place, but something that is more, more cultural. Uh, and that's one of the things I miss, seriously miss, from my experience in several European research institutes, is that there is very little socializing at work. So, um, 
And, um, and the interesting extra work academic activities. For instance, most of my colleagues will have, would have declined this invitation just because, I'm, I mean, I'm having a great time here this afternoon. I don't understand them, but they say, oh, no, 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 I have work to do. I mean, okay, this, uh, the day has 24 hours, but never mind. And, uh, and, um, and so it's, it's actually half, if you spend more than half an hour having coffee with a colleague, then they, well, it's, 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 yeah. Uh, they don't work hard, just, yeah, yeah. Which, which I used to do a lot in, in, in Cambridge, but I, you know, I had a great time, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but this also, it actually reflects on the infrastructure. So the institute where I work now is, I, I think, six years old. So it's a new, a new institute. There is no common cafeteria or canteen or something like that where people go and have lunch together. All the institutes I've been working for, they did have that, also with microwaves in case you bring your own food. People would just at lunchtime, without having, you know, scheduled it. They just, you go for lunch, you know you're going to meet 50 of your colleagues, have lunch with them, then go back to work. It's something very simple, very trivial. From what I heard, is not, it's common here not to have such an infrastructure, which I don't think makes a building that more expensive. Um, and it's very common in Europe. So that's one of the, the big differences. And the other thing, I didn't put it here, I'm not sure if this is more controversial, and that's why I think initiatives like this are very important, uh, and you'll tell me what you think. I think there is a greater knowledge in Europe about what is happening here than the other way around, right? So you were complaining lack of information about these uh, opportunities, and, and that reflects when I, when I interact with my colleagues that are not Europeans or that are North American, that there is uh, I, I do understand. I mean, you're in a, in a wealthy country, things go well, research is good, life is good, everything is good. I mean, you don't, and it's, uh, I, I don't know why, and you, this is very, you know, again, a gut feeling here, but uh, tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's one of the things you, um, we, us Europeans can sort of bring uh, to Canada is this, uh, okay, I mean, um, if being well-rounded and knowing a bit more about what is going somewhere else and actually going, going for coffee with your colleagues is not going to really affect the way you work that much and you might be even be more successful because opportunities for collaboration and the congeniality with the people you're working with and so on get improved. So that's the only minus, I would say, when I compare my experience here with the one I had in Europe. Okay? And um, final slide. Um, so what happens after I, I go, well, the return phase says that I'm going to spend a year uh, in the Institute of Molecular Medicine uh, in Portugal. This is one of the, in, in my opinion, one of the leading research institutes in the field in, in Portugal. So I'll get back to work with, more or less directly with the person I started my PhD with. So 10 years later or 12 years later, I kind of close the loop. Um, and after that, I have no idea. So I haven't made any plans and life changes. And so I would say if I decide to, to, to stay in Portugal, this is probably going to be a good, a good opportunity to, you know, to settle down. If not, and uh, I, you know, you hear in the news that uh, my country is, is struggling financially, so we don't know how this is going to evolve in the next two, two or three years. So it might not be a good place to do science when I go back, or it might actually recover a bit and I'll be, you know, uh, sunny and nice food and research, not that bad. I might decide to stay. I don't know, family will be there. Uh, we'll see. But I, I'm enjoying Canada, so coming back is not out of the, of the question. And um, this is all I had to say, apart from answering your, your questions. So, yeah. Thank you.